Welcome back to Human and Nat and Fizz. This is the very beginning of the spring 2022 semester in which we're looking at BI 252, which is the second semester of Human and Nat and Fizz 2. This is Ed Zalisco. I've been a biology professor at Blackburn College now for, uh, well, this is my the end of my 33rd year and I'll be retiring at the end of this semester. Um, this is the second semester, as I said, of A&P 2, and I've only taught it one time before, and that was in the spring of 2020 when things got horribly interrupted in the middle of the semester. So let's see how things go right now, but I'm afraid that we are still in the middle of a horrible battle now with a new variant, Omicron, that is spiking cases like never before. In our own county, the cases uh, are 50% above the last record peak, 50% above. We just broke the peak record from one week ago. So we are just having screaming danger of Omicron right now, and everyone must be wearing the best masks you can get, which would be an N95 or a KN95. And as you've been able to see in the various information I've sent out, the syllabi and some emails, um, only N95, KN95, or surgical masks are accepted within uh, any, any time the zoology lab may hand 136. Let's get going here. I have some introductory material uh, that I want to talk to you about as, as we get started, and we're beginning with chapter 25, which is the digestive system. We will be looking at the digestive system in lab, um, not this first week, which next week uh, would be about the 18th of January, but instead about the very, very first week of February, we start looking at digestive system histology and then also return to our cat dissections. You will want to look at the lab syllabus for those kinds of details. I want to set up a little bit of, of how I've structured this lecture, which this series of lectures for Human and Nat and Phys 2. Of course, we're recording right now because the college is remote for the first three days. And stay tuned because I actually believe that, that some other kind of option like this is going to be necessary because this Omicron variant is not expected to subside until sometime in February. So we'll stay posted and, and follow closely. The structure of this semester is quite different than the structure of Human and Atom Phys 1. In Human and Atom Phys 2 this semester, BI 252, we follow the textbook very, very closely as we go through some details, and in fact, some very detailed systems of, of, of the human body, and we try to make sure that everyone has a very, very good foundation for whatever you're going to do with this class. This class, for example, uh, Human and Atom Phys 1 and 2, a full year, serves as a foundation for all sorts of health professions, uh, but maybe it just helps you to understand your own body and what's going on. That can be very, very helpful. So here I have some advice on taking notes, and I've said already that, as you can see at the top here, this is on your lecture outline as well. So right now what I'm putting on the slide is all on your lecture outline. And that is to say that this class, the one-year human anatomy phys, just about anywhere you take it, unless, in my mind, they are not doing their job, must be an intense uh, very much a lot of vocabulary, very lot of details, an awful lot of foundations of the human body. It's an introduction to the different systems of the body and how they work and how they work together with other systems of the body. Nothing here is simple. This is a challenging course. However, the good news is we are, we are following the textbook quite closely. My job is to try to make these lectures interesting and to add some things to your textbook information. Uh, but I'm going to be going over things quite quickly. And the lectures are not a time for you to be taking a lot of notes, detailed notes. And so a, a little bit of advice on that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Definitions. Uh, if I were you, I would come up with a system right away that would allow me to write down a term that I want to define, but maybe you write the term and then your code might be circle that term or underline it or do something else, and you'll know then that means you need to go to the textbook and get that definition. 
it is very likely in the chapter that we are addressing uh, at the time. So if it's digestive system, it's going to be in the digestive system chapter. Okay, so look them up later is what I'm saying. So if you want to do well in the class to get an A or B, what do I think you should do? And here's how I advise you to approach this class. First, and we know this already, if you have a professor in any class who is addressing information that is well addressed in the textbook for that class, the best thing you can do is to read ahead, to already be somewhat familiar with the information that the professor is going to lecture about. Boy, oh boy, it prepares the mind. It means then that in lecture, that will not be the first time lecture that you hear something. You'll go, yeah, okay, that sounds familiar, and then you'll hear more about it. Now, I don't suggest you read too far ahead, and the reason is is that, well, then uh, that can be overwhelming, and it might not even be retained well enough to be all that useful. So you're working just a day or two ahead. Um, as we're working through, you might want to keep your textbook open, and you might want to note some things on your textbook. Maybe use pencil and write very lightly. Uh, but if there are some notes that you want to add to a figure, I'm going to be using an awful lot of the figures straight out of your textbook. I'll have the figure numbers indicated. Uh, figure numbers are also on your lecture outline. So right now, uh, you might want to pause this, this video, this recording, and make sure that you have a copy of the lecture outline available right now as we go through uh, these lectures and as we get going. All of the lecture outlines for the entire semester are already posted on the portal, so those are available to you. So get that lecture outline and use it right now as, we're, as we go ahead. I said already about defining terms later. Another part of the system is to use FS. We've talked about functional significance before, and that really is a function, but it's not just a minor function. It's a major function. And if I were you, I would write fs next to any terms where the function was discussed and was, of course, significant. Finally, as we go through all the mechanics, geez, of going through lecture and getting a new system going, um, maybe some of this is familiar from past classes, please don't forget to just be curious, just to wonder. As you're looking at something, please try to wonder. And you know that I like to begin my classes not with going over the syllabus, and we're not doing that, uh, but not with a lot of details, but actually some things that get your attention and help you be curious. And so we will do that in just a couple minutes. But I want this class to be personally significant. This class is not just something to check a box. I think so much, as, as now I'm getting, well, I am an old man, um, as I think back in my life, as I've tried to understand my own health problems and the problems of people I care for, I always do that in the context that I understand a lot about human anatomy phys. And I think to myself, my goodness, if you were a person who didn't understand a lot of human anatomy phys, what, what, would, what would the information you get from Oh, I don't know, a doctor or a nurse or somebody else or something you read on the internet. What would that all mean? You don't have the background to really understand it. You don't have the background to make sense. Now, little things could be alarming to you, but they're of little significance. And, and on the other end, little things that are significant, you might ignore. Um, understanding pain, understanding when, where something hurts. Uh, sometimes it hurts in another place but sometimes in your own stomach area and understanding intestinal cramps and uterine cramps, all sort, mus other muscle cramps, skeletal muscle, all of this um, in the context of knowing something about human anatomy phys makes it a lot easier to work through medicine and these kinds of problems. So that's what I want this to be for you. In most schools, you should know, <clears throat> given how difficult I've already set this up, that a and is a weed-out course. Um, early in my career, when I applied to lots of different places, this was the class that they all wanted me to teach, a one-year a and class. And in some cases, that's all I would do. It would be a really, really big class, full of people, mostly who were interested in nursing, 
but other students, for example, in physical therapy or occupational therapy would need this class. And I would be told when I would consider these other jobs that maybe 50% of the class would not graduate from the class. 50% would flunk or drop the class because it's that tough. So people interested in going into some of these very important fields of nursing, oh my goodness, if you didn't appreciate the field of nursing and being a physician and a PA and a nurse practitioner, if you didn't appreciate those roles, um, this COVID pandemic has certainly drawn our attention to those vital, vital uh, occupations. <clears throat> well, I don't want this to be a weed out class. That's what I want you to know. I don't want that at all. I'm trying to create a really well-structured class, got all the lecture outlines. In this semester, we're going very closely with the textbook. And I want you to succeed. I want all of you to succeed. We want to be there. Uh, two of your TAs, Jasmine and Morgan, both had this class two years ago. Further, another TA, Cheyenne, who's in the class right now, uh, one of my TAs, uh, is in, of course, with you. And Cheyenne is, is a very strong student and should be able to help you just as well in, in her role as one of my TAs. <clears throat> All right. Generally speaking, I don't give out my PowerPoints and I don't do so because it discourages people from engaging in class. It discourages them from studying the textbook. And in some cases, students just don't come to lecture or see lectures at all if they have the PowerPoints. On the other hand, when we're recording these lectures, you get the whole thing recorded. So lucky you. Uh, but generally, if we do go back to in-person, and my expectation right now, and this is January 11th for uh, 2022, uh, my expectation, expectation right now is that we're going to struggle through January and February, um, all of us at Blackburn College, uh, to be safe and when, to get through this Omicron variant of the COVID virus but that I'm very hopeful for the last half of the semester, for March and April at least, uh, that things can greatly improve. But right now, guys, we got to buckle down and be really safe. So uh, I don't know if uh, these first couple lectures are the only lectures that I'll be recording. There may be more. Let's stay posted to what the college advises. So what do I want? I want you to come and think about the content. I want you to write a few notes about what we talked about, but I mostly want you to see. I've got some really, really good images on these PowerPoints, some images that are not in your textbook and not available, uh, at least where I can find them. And I think they really illustrate, and that's a, a good thing to do, to look at pictures of things and to see it from a different perspective, sometimes a clinical perspective like an x-ray, and for me to talk you through a little bit and, and to help further, uh, further your understanding, expand that understanding. So we've got lecture outlines. Um, you want to keep your textbook handy. So right now, if I were you during any of my lectures, I would have your textbook. We're using the eighth edition. There is a ninth edition. And I haven't, I have not compared the pages side by side, but I'm going to expect that things are very, very similar. If you're using the ninth edition, or if you're using resources for the ninth edition, I leave it up to you to compare the ninth edition to the eighth edition, which is the official edition that we're using. Um, so the eighth edition, a copy, a hard copy of that is available in the Zolab. Um, the eighth edition should be available on the internet as a hard copy pretty cheaply because it's not the latest edition, and that's one of the reasons that I I adopted the 8th and didn't move up to the ninth. was that I thought you guys could get it uh, more cheaply. And, and be honest here, this is not a fast-moving field. Basic human anatomy phys does not require new editions of a textbook every three years. So, let's see how things go. Let's have a little fun. Let's stimulate that, that curiosity. Now, at the start here, I don't want you to think that I'm encouraging you to eat potato chips. But here are some people that seem to be pretty interested in potato chips. And potato chips is a common item that students eat. I hope you don't eat too many. There are other snack foods, I'm, I'm aware, other kinds of chips. But let's focus right now, as we, we begin our look at the digestive system, let's focus on the consumption of a potato chip 
and ask some basic questions. First, we all eat. Why? Why do we need to eat? Is this just something we like to do? Like, like playing in sports? Is this just an activity? Reading? Listening to music? Is this just something we enjoy? Or do we need to eat? Well, of course we need to eat. You might say, well, we need to eat because we're alive. And then I would say, yeah, but plants don't eat like we eat most of the time. There are, of course, carnivorous plants. We eat because we have to sustain ourselves. We eat because we burn an awful lot of calories. We talked about this in Human Anatomy Phys 1. We are a, a very, very inefficient system. We have to take in a lot of food, and most of the energy is lost as heat. And as you know, the quality of what we eat matters. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on nutrition. There is an assignment for you in your textbook, so do see the syllabus. But we generally know it's good for us and not, and potato chips is in that not category. What I want to focus on is the actual process of eating. Let's think about what the digestive system of our body does for us, okay? Maybe you have some questions, uh, uh, basic questions, or maybe um, the questions that I'm raising right here will be something you didn't think about. So number one, why do we chew? So think right now, when you're taking things into your body, nu nutrients of some sort, do we chew everything? No, you drink orange juice, right? <clears throat> Why do we chew? Right now, if you're thinking about chips, maybe you're hungry, maybe it's later, or maybe you're not, saliva might come into your mouth just thinking about the chips. What's causing that to happen? Here's a fun one. When we are chewing, and that saliva is in there mixing, and we're chomping down on whatever we put in our mouth, how do we know when we've chewed enough? How do we know when we're ready to swallow? And sometimes you might have hurried up and munched something down, maybe because you needed to talk. Somebody called you, or somebody's calling to you who's nearby, and you quickly swallow, maybe a little early, and you know that it might not go down very well. In fact, a, a chunk of chip could, could cut you. So how do we know when we've chewed enough and when we swallow? And by the way, when you swallow, I think most of you know those chips are headed for your stomach, but, but how do they get there? And not just the anatomy, not just while well, they go down this tube. How does it actually move through that tube? You've swallowed, right? <clears throat> and the moment that you swallow, the food isn't then entering the stomach. There's a passage of time. What's happening? <clears throat> so if you remember human and and phys, I started out with all kinds of questions, and that's what I'm trying to do here to get you interested in the digestive system. But you probably thought I was done talking about chips. Nope, I got more. <clears throat> When you have food, when you've taken in a meal and it's in your stomach, if you lean over to tie your shoes, why doesn't it just spill out? Why isn't it just kind of like a cup, maybe with coffee? I've got a cup of coffee right here. There you go, I just put down the cup of coffee. Right now that little bit of coffee is in my stomach. If I lean over, will that coffee come out my mouth, come out my nose? Why not? If sometime after you're eating, you burp, maybe you burp as you were taking in some air when you were taking in your potato chips. And here I'm using a non-technical term, puking. I'm not sure that that's actually how you spell puking, by the way. But if you burp, why don't you actually upchuck the food in your stomach? How's that possible? How can you release gas without releasing the other contents of your stomach? And once we get those little bits of chips down in our stomach that have our spitty saliva all over them, how are the chips broken down further? And how does it make a difference? So we bring in food, maybe something more nutritious like an apple. 
And you take bites of apple and you swallow bites of apple and now bites of apple are in your stomach. How does any of the good stuff in the apple make it into the rest of your body? How do your legs benefit from eating an apple? And by the way, how does your body determine then what parts of the apple or the parts of potato chips are never absorbed? Pass out with the feces. This is generally the introduction here, guys, to our look at the human digestive system. And of course, everything's going to be human from here on out. And it's sort of the opposite of my zoology class, right? In which I tried not to make everything about humans and to talk about all kinds of other kinds of critters. So we're going to do a general introduction to the digestive tract. It might take more than a day. We'll go through and look at some basic anatomy to get going here. Uh, and then we'll look at, in, in detail, at the different parts of the digestive system. So I'm going to do an overview, and then we'll come back, so in about two lectures, and we'll look in detail at the sections of the digestive system, that's what the arrow the curse is trying to do, and follow the pathway about what happens here all along the course of digestion from the intake of food to the expulsion of those things that are not digested. So we asked the question, why do we have to eat at all? Why do we have a digestive system? And we've pretty much covered these kinds of functions of, of what is it that a digestive system has to do. It processes food. Somehow it breaks it down mechanically and chemically, I'll tell you. And then the good part. We, we actually get something from the food. It extracts the nutrients. In some cases, that's simple moisture. In other cases, it's uh, vitamins and minerals and sources of calories. And then the undigested parts, for example, with an apple, would be an awful lot of cell walls. We call that fiber. A lot of fiber. Cell walls, it, by the way, fiber can be more than cell walls. It can be materials that are between the cells. Uh, but in any case, the fiber is, is one part of an apple, anyway, that would be eliminated from the body. So, let's think about some basics here. Most nutrients that we eat cannot be used in the form that we take them in. Okay? So, here's a fun thought. We don't have raisins or apples in our arteries. Not sure you hear that very often, but you might have eaten raisins in your life or apples in your life. And if you just think about the basics, um, yeah, I guess that's right. You know, there's parts of the raisins and parts of the apples that do make it into our arteries, but somehow that's really, really well broken down and selectively absorbed. So what is it the digestive system has to do? Well, it has to be a disassembly line. And we talked about this actually when we looked at earthworms in my zoology class. If you looked at earthworms, we talked about the one way, because earthworms were the first phylum that we looked at that had an anus. And by having an anus, it meant that their digestive tract was all one way. That food is ingested and then it is digested within the, the system of the body. And then, of course, at the opposite end, whatever wasn't digested is eliminated. So we talked about that being a disassembly line, okay? <clears throat> Here's a term for you, and that, again, write this down, gastroenterology um, is the field of biology that's going to take a look at your digestive tract and, and see if there's some problems. So, for example, if somebody has um, problems digesting, uh, oh gosh, dairy or gluten or any number of other things that, that you could have a problem with, you probably go to see a gastroenterologist. By the way, the word root gastro, the word root entero, are really important for you to learn. Ology, of course, is the study of something. And yep, we are still doing word roots. Okay? I had to stop a phone call. Boy, I wish I didn't have to deal with these kinds of things. Okay, moving on, gastroenterology, the study of the digestive tract, and here, five stages of digestion, and you should know that I'm going to be moving pretty quickly through things that are very straightforward, so you've got the screen right here uh, that you can see, 
it tells you what each of these steps are and they're defined right there and then further uh, you can see that it's page 948 for you to look them up and if the edition is is off if this is seventh or if you have the ninth edition it's going to be really close nearby my question to you is this where do each of the above occur well this is pretty easy ingestion is going to involve the mouth right and ingestion is going to involve the throat uh, so the pharyngeal regions and it's going to involve the esophagus Mechanical digestion is occurring in the mouth, along with a little bit of chemical digestion. Saliva is doing some of that. But more chemical digestion is going to be going on in the stomach and, and in a big way in the small intestine. Where is absorption occurring? Well, there is some absorption, uh, a lot of it uh, actually going on in the small intestine. Small amounts going on in the stomach and lots more also in the large intestine. As food moves through in a very slurry kind of a milkshake consistency, kind of a smoothie consistency, uh, that, that consistency in the small intestine, in the small intestine then kind of a smoothie, that makes its way down to the large intestine where a lot of the fluids are absorbed and there's some compaction going on in the formation of feces. And that means that if the large intestine doesn't have the chance to do number four here, then the sort of smoothie composition in your small intestine is going to come out in the defecation and that's diarrhea. So if we skip step four because there's some irritation of your digestive tract and, and what you've ingested is moving through you really, really quickly, you just go from three, which is smoothie, uh, don't have compaction, the formation of feces, and defecation then is, is the diarrhea. <clears throat> All right, now taking things a little more slowly, that was an overview. Mechanical digestion, biting into that apple. So clearly, you couldn't swallow a big apple. So why do we chew? For starters, to break whatever we're ingesting down to pieces small enough to swallow. What are we using for mechanical digestion? Well, there's really two major parts. One is the teeth, obviously. And the second is that there is muscular action going on in the digestive tract uh, that is peristalsis. It's that squeezing and churning that goes on in your stomach and also in the intestines. So what's the functional significance? Well, first of all, it's said already, teeth are breaking food down into small enough particles to be swallowed. It's actually helpful to chew a little bit more and break those pieces down further because now you got to remember what is the advantage of, of chewing into smaller pieces other than swallowing? Well, one of the hallmarks of the zoology class that people pretty regularly remember, and that's good since it was a good and important theme, were surface to volume ratios. And by chewing up your food into smaller and smaller pieces, you are increasing the surface area, the parts of the area exposed on the food particles because they're smaller and smaller and that makes it more likely that then the next step chemical digestion can occur a little bit faster because there's more surface area okay but there's another functional significance regarding number two here churning of the gut the churning of the gut is mixing okay mixing so this part here we're breaking parts down increasing surface area and making it easier to swallow but second is within the stomach and the small intestine, there's a mixing going on. And so if you think about that, you, you got a fairly large chamber there in the stomach and, and even in the small intestine. And if there were chemical absorption going on, then the surface area of the contents, whatever fluid you got there, the edges of that would be pretty well absorbed, but you wouldn't have done much with what's in the middle of your small intestine. So churning and mixing allows then all of that smoothie kinds of composition of materials in your small intestine to, to have a chance to be absorbed. These are things I'm trying to throw in to make this all a little bit easier uh, to understand and a little more, more than just reading the book. So here's something for you. Um, I was talking with some people who worked on ambulances and, and this one particular person told me that uh, they understood that sometimes 
if if an aspirin is appropriate, if it is if it is appropriate in an emergency, you might suggest that the person chew it up. Now, I don't know if you've tasted aspirins before, but it's not my favorite thing to have with a meal. The question is, how can that help? And my response is that it increases the surface area so that when the aspirin makes its way to the stomach, it's more quickly absorbed. If you had a whole pill in your stomach, that would have to dissolve and break down. But if you chewed it and swallowed all the parts, uh, then it might be more likely to be absorbed quickly in the stomach. The person said to me, well, they thought it's so that it could be absorbed in the esophagus. And we'll get to the esophagus here, uh, maybe in this lecture or maybe the next. And I want you to, to wait for that answer. As we learn about the epithelia of the mouth and the esophagus, you tell me whether or not you think that's where it's likely to be absorbed if you chewed up aspirin. So I'm not going to tell you now. <clears throat> so I told you mechanical digestion was one of the first steps. Chemical digestion, I said, comes second. And there's a series of hydrolytic reactions that are uh, breaking down these, these kind of macromolecules. And here's the key part, breaking down dietary macromolecules into their monomers. Okay. And that's the key part. That's what a lot of chemical digestion is, is doing. So it's mostly digestive enzymes, but of course water. And these are hydrolytic reactions, so water is important. So what are we seeing? What's the functional significance of chemical digestion? Well, these macromolecules are broken down then into their monomers. That would, that would be polysaccharides into monosaccharides, proteins into their amino acids, fats into these, nucleic acids into nucleotides. Some things are present already in a form that they can be used directly. Uh, some sugars are in that category, of course, uh, water being others, being another, um, and here's some other examples. Of course, the beauty of these recorded lectures is you can pause any time, you can take a break, and you can come back, and I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, there is nothing magic about a, a, you know, a lecture period being the best period of time nonstop for you to learn. So I'm actually pr pretty fond of recorded lectures, and it's very likely to be something that for a little while we'll continue to do as we deal with COVID because it, I think it, it's really useful to stop, to let you go back, let you look at the part in the book that's related to this and put it all together. All right, some basic anatomy, something I even struggled with. And of course, see that I've indicated for you that this particular figure is not in uh, your textbook. Digestive tract is a tube. It's open on both ends. We talked about this with earthworms, right? Um, one of the things that people told me all along is that something ingested and then defecated was never really in your body. People had said that regularly to me. So fiber, uh, fiber from an apple would be one of those things. Well, I said, yeah, I know what you're saying. It wasn't within my bloodstream, but it still was in my body. Um, those parts of the apples that you don't digest and you defecate, um, those were heated by my body, right? There was moisture in there that left them, um, and they were contained in my body. They were transported in my body. So uh, I don't know if I'm happy with that simplistic kind of comment that food that's ingested and, and expelled was never really in your body. Okay. I think it is, but it didn't enter into your circulatory system for sure. Now taking a look at, uh, you know, first figure of this chapter, guys. We've made it all the way here. Um, here you're seeing not just uh, the details of the tubing, but you're looking at all the other ancillary structures. The digestive system, of course, includes that tube that begins in your mouth, and extends the pharynx and esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, and then um, the anus at the other end. But there are these tremendous numbers of accessory organs, and here they are indicated in boxes. So lots 
and this is not a complete list. So the tube itself, about 30 feet, it includes these kinds of sections. But the whole gastrointestinal tract is the stomach and intestines, and then all of these kinds of accessory organs associated with it. Okay. So when we think about the GI tract, um, yes, it's the tube itself, but we have to consider these accessory organs. And we're going to spend time in this chapter and talking about this because it's that important. Okay, a little side note. Now, I mentioned this already. Um, the lectures are going to include some photographs that were provided to instructors from McGraw-Hill. And I believe you only get these during lecture unless you can find some source, and undoubtedly it's the internet that somebody's posted some of these elsewhere, but they're pretty big files, and I don't know where else you can find them, and so it's good that you're following this along because here are some of those photos. And I think they're really neat. So this is an actual cadaver dissection, and this is what I appreciate. And then they've modified this with a little coloration to highlight the part of the actual cadaver dissection. So just for orientation, do you know what this is right here? And the answer is the liver. And if this is the liver, then what is this thing right here? Cut in cross section. It's a sheet, so there you can see the parts of the sheet right over in there. And there's the edge. And so liver, that would be the diaphragm. What is this? And that's the gallbladder. Stomach here, leading, and then it looks like it was cut out to the small intestine over here. Well, here they're highlighting mesentery, so that not only are we thinking about the tube itself, here of the intestines, the small intestines, but the suspension, the actual mesentery itself. This is another figure, not in Saladin, right here. And over here we see the small intestine, and here's the back of the body wall, so this is anterior, or, I, because I'm a comparative anatomist, this is ventral. And this is dorsal or posterior, and there's the vertebral column right there. Okay, and here we've got some sections of colon. But here what we're looking at is the very base, the connection of the intestine to the main trunk of the body. A lot of musculature here in the bones. So one thing a mesentery does is helps to anchor, single word, that's really good, anchor the small intestine to the trunk of the body. And there we have four of the main functions of mesenteries. <clears throat> Don't really have to talk about them, you can read this. But um, I like to think about this. So anchoring this keeps it in its position, keeps it from getting tangled. Uh, we talked about function of mesenteries in zoology, and I'm expecting you've had that with me. So we have blood vessels that are coursing to the small intestine. Uh, through the mesentery, and what that's doing then is keeping the blood vessels from getting tugged on too much. The mesentery is absorbing some of those forces, so it protects the blood vessels. All right, all kinds of other sheets of tissue. Uh, serous membrane, we talked about mucus and serous membranes. Serous membranes are closed cavities. They're lining closed cavities of the body. Here the peritoneum is defined for you, and this is very, very broad. And now you can see different areas of that. So you had to know parietal and visceral peritoneum back in human anatomy phase one. The peritoneal cavity, which is part of the coelom. Uh, lesser omentum, a little bit right there. Greater omentum right here. And then there's, uh, uh, sorry, greater omentum right over here. And this is the mesentery supporting the small intestines that we just talked about, okay? So this is lesser omentum, greater omentum. Lucy, if you're hearing her behind us, is having a dream <laughs> and just making noises. So we'll have to work through that. But over here is the mesentery that's supporting the small intestine that we just talked about. You hear that? That's Lucy. She's, she's breathing and dreaming. Lucy, wake up, sweetie pie. Don't make too much noise to disturbing everybody. So here's uh, another view of lesser omentum. This is a figure in your book, 25-3. And the greater omentum, which when you open up the cat and open up the salomic cavity here, you'll see this big draped 
fatty, highly lymphatic sheet of tissue right here that's kind of a fold over on top of the small intestines. And now we can see that in a different view on these cadaver dissections. So sometimes people refer to the great omentum as like an apron, a sheet laying over the small intestines. Here, just showing you a bit more of, of what we're seeing on some of these sheets and what they're doing. So. <clears throat> and now a really big topic. Now this really big topic is looking at the histology of, of the digestive tract. Now I didn't say of the intestine, I said digestive tract. So it turns out, this is figure 25 too, that the structure of the esophagus, the structure of the stomach, the structure of all the intestines follows this basic pattern. And when we do the histology of the digestive tract, which is scheduled for about that first week of February, as we get into the dissection and do some of this, we're going to be looking at slides and finding these kinds of layers. Okay? So we're going to do this in some detail, but this is the basic plan then. And what we've got is a, is a mucosa, of course, submucosa. And so the defining edge of that is this little muscular, it's got to follow the line down, but this little bitty thin line of muscle right here. This is an epithelium, connective tissue, and then muscle. And I'll have a much bigger picture of this to show you. That muscularis mucosa is the bottom of the mucosa. That's the bottom extent of this first layer of the mucosa. Then below that is the submucosa. Sub means below, so that's easy to understand. And then we have the very thick muscular layers. That's the muscularis externa here. And then uh, a very thin serosa that's on that surface. Okay. And there's basically the composition of each one of these. And that's figure 25-2 in your textbook. So uh, during the lab, scheduled for about 1 or 2 February, we're going to look at the histology of this in some detail. Okay. So what we want to do is look at uh, now, uh, just focus a little bit more on exactly what this is. And I want to remind you again, this is the basic histology of the digestive tract. It's kind of interesting. So go back and, and remember that our ancestors, uh, are, we did not come from earthworms, but we have patterns that are like earthworms because we're sharing common ancestors. And in the digestive tract of an earthworm, you're not surprised that it's pretty similar. Here in us, it's quite elaborated into a stomach and small intestines and an esophagus and parts of our mouth. But what I'm saying is, even though it's elaborated in us into lots of specializations, it still has this common plan, common plan. And that's what we're looking at right now, the common histology and histological structure of the digestive tract. Okay, so here's that bigger picture that I promised. And we're going to take these one at a time right here. The epithelium is the inner lining that we would expect. And as I'm noting, this is a variable region of the histology of the digestive tract. In the mouth and in the esophagus, this is stratified squamous. Okay. Now, now that's the case for the mouth and the esophagus, but that's not the case for the stomach and the intestines. So here we see the epithelium, just below that the lamina propria with a lot of connective tissue in it, blood vessels, and then that muscularis mucosa that's right there. Okay. In most of the digestive tract, in the um, stomach and in the intestines, the inner epithelium is a simple columnar epithelium, and it's all about surface, ab about absorption, right there. I mentioned to you that in the stomach and the esophagus, it's stratified squamous. Also, at the very end, in the anal canal, it's stratified squamous. So, on both ends of us, taking food in and expelling it, those are areas of high friction, high friction. So, the functional significance here is to resist abrasion. The functional significance of the simple columnar is, is going to be for absorption. Okay? 
So this is an important distinction. You want to make sure you see that. This is, as we're going through this, this is not something that's, that's easy to see and understand. The lamina propria that's underneath, uh, a very loose connective tissue layer, um, and, and in that we'll look and see that there are blood vessels and nerves and, and ducts that are coursing through. And finally, the muscularis mucosa. Um, the muscularis mucosa, of course, is muscle, smooth muscle, able to contract. And when it contracts, it really does two things. It's groovy. It creates these little grooves and ridges that increases surface area. And likewise, it changes. Because if it created grooves and it just stuck with grooves, if there were just grooves always within, let's say, the small intestine, can you think of a problem that might result from just having grooves? And if you had never-changing grooves, stuff could get stuck in there. It's not a very good thorough mixing. So this muscularis mucosus can stretch and contract, stretch and contract, and allow things to be moved out of the grooves. That's my point. So moving material in and out of the grooves. <clears throat> also associated with uh, the mucosa is this, and, and that's the acronym, so it, it can be misleading because malt sounds like a kind of a sugar or something that belongs in a, milk, a milkshake because that's the kind of sugar they put in the milkshake. In any case, this is mucosa-associated <clears throat> lymphatic tissue. So the lymphatic system invades into the mucosa. Why? Well, um, because it's important that our immune system is patrolling what it is that we've ingested. Uh, there can be all kinds of microbes on the food or anything we touch and swallow or that makes its way into our digestive tract. Just below the mucosa, submucosa. Bigger, thicker connective tissue area. You can see right here all the kinds of things that we find within the submucosa, including some glands that are helping to provide lubrication inside the intestinal wall. Finally, the muscularis externa, which are these very thick muscular layers, <clears throat> and they're running in two opposite directions. Um, the inner circular is going to constrict and narrow the passageway. That's what I need to make sure you understand. The inner circular muscle layer, first and foremost, when it contracts, it makes the, the opening, so it, uh, well, the diameter, of the lumen of the tube would be narrower. Okay, it, it shrinks down. It's it's a bit like the drawstring on a pair of sweatpants. If you have sweatpants or a hoodie that have a drawstring, it can narrow that opening. And so the inner circular layer can be modified to form these sphincters or valves that regulate passage of material. You have such sphincters between your esophagus and your stomach. And that's why that sphincter can open just a little bit and let air out or gas out, but not the contents of the stomach. So when I asked why can you burp without vomiting, the answer is because the sphincter can relax just a little bit and let the gas out without letting out the material. Second, I asked the question after I consume something like coffee or you have a smoothie or something else and it's in your stomach and now you lean over you, you, get, you invert yourself for whatever reason. Maybe you're tying your shoes. And when you do that, why doesn't the contents of your stomach come out your mouth? That was that question. These are great multiple choice questions. And the answer is, if they're functioning properly, those sphincters are constricting and, and keeping the contents of the stomach in the stomach. The outer longitudinal layer <clears throat> is going to cause the digestive tract to get shorter when it contracts. And so when it gets shorter and then longer, it's helping to move materials through the digestive tract. The two working together actually are necessary. So the inner circular can kind of squeeze behind the food and the longitudinal can contract and move the food along just as well. And this again is a bit like how earthworms move. A series of these circular contractions and longitudinal. And just as a little aside, not to confuse you, the layers were actually the opposite in an earthworm. 
So it was inner longitudinal and outer circular, I believe. All right, finally, there's this very, very thin epithelium, the serosa, that's on the outside of most of the digestive tract. Okay, it's a thin layer. Um, it's got a simple squamous epithelium, sometimes called the mesothelium. Um, there are parts of the esophagus that are sort of embedded in connective tissue. Parts of the esophagus embedded in connective tissue in your upper chest, and those do not have a serosa. They're surrounded by connective tissue. And we're going to learn about that in just a second. So it's where the, the esophagus sort of becomes free into a space that this serosa first begins. Continues all along, then the esophagus, the stomach, small intestines, and large intestines until just before the rectum. And so at the opposite end, uh, the rectum itself becomes enmeshed in connective tissue. And where, where the esophagus is enmeshed in connective tissue before the serosa, or the rectum in this connective tissue at the end of the digestive tract, that binding is on the outside is called adventitia. And it's, it's got this composition that you can see here. So at the very beginning of the digestive tract and the end of, of the digestive tract, this is really, really, really well anchored really well anchored, and that's the adventitia. So this is the kind of histology, uh, a real slide that we'll look at in lab, and you'll have to, to go through here. This is the mucosa itself. You might be able to make your way down and see at the very bottom um, this very thin muscular layer, and then the submucosa uh, is very distinct between the two. And, and clearly the muscular, the smooth muscle layers will be real easy to see, and then on the very surface, the serosa. Now I want to talk about the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system is, is something that's characteristic only of the digestive tract. For students who took my development class, they would have learned that this enteric system actually forms altogether differently and that there can be parts of this enteric nervous system that don't form properly. And so a newborn, whatever it is, it could be a, a little colt, a horse, or a calf, or a dog, or, or of course cat, or anybody else's mammal, pet, if it didn't form properly, then there's problems regulating the digestive tract. And we're going to see all the kinds of things it regulates. It regulates the movement of these muscles and the movement of materials through the digestive tract, also, the secretion from glands that, well, we just looked at, provides some lubrication within the lumen of the digestive tract, and blood flow. So, this is a very interesting system, and it's quite distinct, this enteric system, quite distinct. Um, I do not at all know the details of the microbiome's interaction with the other systems of our body, but I've heard and read just basic things about how our microbiome, and that is the kinds of bacteria that live within our digestive tract, are affecting our nervous system. And here is one place where the nervous system is, is part of, of all that system. So you can see these kinds of details here. Um, and this is part of the autonomic nervous system, which means, and I mentioned to you in human anatomy, there's one that when you see autonomic, think automatic. This is where it's not consciously something you think about, and that's good because moving food through your digestive tract is one thing you do not have to concentrate and remember to do today. Yay, we have an automatic autopilot part of that system. Okay. The entire our nervous system has these two parts, submucosal, and then this Auerbach, or myenteric plexus. The submucosal part is regulating these glandular secretions and the muscularis mucosa. Okay, so those are all very, very close in the submucosa or near the submucosa. And then the Auerbach plexus is much more about peristalsis and these kinds of muscular contractions. So what do we need to regulate in the digestive tract? These two things, motility and secretion. Motility is moving things 
through the digestive tract. Secretion then is um, the things that are being released inside. And these two important functions of the digestive tract are controlled then not only by the enteric nervous system, but there are hormones and uh, paracrine factors, uh, which are local, sort of local hormones that are helping to control that. The neuronal control are these kinds of reflexes. Some of them are reflexes where when, when what's moving through the digestive tract stretches the digestive tract, that can trigger a reflex. Or there could be chemical stimulation just as well. So interestingly, you might have, well, we were mostly, I was, talking about the movement of materials through the intestines. But this also relates to the movements involved in swallowing. So you might know that there's a part of swallowing that's voluntary. At some point you decide, like right now, you got spit in your mouth maybe, or I do, or I'll get some more coffee. And there's a part where I choose to swallow, and then there's an automatic part that takes over. And this is that vega vagal, which is fun to say, reflex that's parasympathetic. And that's helping to move things along very, very nicely. So this is the end of the overview. This is the end of where I go through everything. And this was a very nice first lecture. It went a couple minutes long, but we're doing introductory things. And this is what I wanted to address. This is the, the big overview. What we're going to do next is take each section one at a time and, and look in some details, OK, in the order of its natural flow or as I like to say, from top to bottom. So we're stopping here. This is the end of the first recorded lecture in BI 252, spring of 2022. Ed Zolisko, signing off.